season one of Written in Stone, the 1990s is supported by Tension Climbing, wooden training tools designed with purpose in Denver, Colorado. Use the code STONE, that's S-T-O-N-E, to get 10% off of your next purchase at tensionclimbing.com and to let them know that their support for this show matters. Not valid for tension board sets, hardware, or gift cards. It cannot be combined with other offers. Tensionclimbing.com. Mastery over success. Written in Stone is co-created by Power Company Climbing products, training plans, and education to help you become a better climber. PowerCompanyClimbing.com. Use the code STONE, that's S-T-O-N-E, for 20% off of almost everything. Learn. Grow. Excel. The Americans were pissed. Well, some of them. Others were excited to see the standards raised. And still others were conflicted. They wanted the new level, a tangible measure of progress, but they wanted to be the ones to realize it, not this brash Frenchman with endless endurance and ego to match. And to make matters worse, this wasn't the first time he had flown across the North Atlantic and claimed one of their projects, right in their faces sometimes covertly after being asked to keep off. On one of those occasions, he'd given the route the ironic name, I am a bad man. Even in this, the dawn of a new age in the birthplace of American sport climbing, Smith Rock, that was a little too open-minded for the locals. But still, the bar for climbing in the US had been raised, and that was cause for celebration which is how French superstar Jean-Baptiste Trebou found himself at a party in Oregon, thrown to celebrate his ascent of their hardest, proudest project. And if you've ever been to a climber party, you know what happened next. Someone initiated a pull-up competition. Because of course they did. Maybe they thought this is a way they could win one. But they were wrong fueled by, among other things, a healthy dose of cocaine, Trebu wasn't about to let someone else take the trophy. And so he cranked out 80, yes, 80 pull-ups in a row. Seems he was inspired by all sorts of lines. It was the dawn of the 90s after all, and Jibé Trebu was a bona fide rock star. Chris Hampton, you're listening to Written in Stone, climbing's most important ascents. This is season one, the 1990s. The single-minded obsession that would lead a person to fly across the world just to be the first to climb a thing started early for Jibé Tribu. His parents, also climbers, introduced him to the boulders of Fontainebleau when he was five, around 1966. By the time he was 10, his parents began to worry that the amount of climbing their son was doing every day, all day, nonstop, would end up stunning his growth. That, of course, didn't happen, but it did massively benefit his growth as a climber. It was around this same time, the early 70s, that young Trebu began climbing on a rope at a crag near Paris called Sassois. Because it was stacked with not only hard roots, but had a reputation as notoriously beta-intensive, climbers there had adopted the same mentality that allowed them to solve the difficult, body-position-dependent sandstone puzzles in Fontainebleau working out the individual moves before eventually putting it all together. And by the 80s, these same climbers, Trebu, the talented Les Menestral brothers, and more, would travel on climbing holidays to southern France, where, 
led by the legendary Patrick Edlanger, the ethic was all on site, all the time. These two styles mixed and merged, meaning that not only were the French climbers becoming the best at on sighting, but also doing more hard routes faster than just about anyone else. And while 8A, or 13B, had been established in the U.S. by Tony Yanniro, and a few others had popped up here and there, it was 1983 in France when the grade exploded. So many French climbers were reaching the pinnacle of the grading scale that there's still heavy debate over which 8A was established first. And we aren't talking about an argument between two. There are four or five routes in the running, all candidates for the first 8A in France, and all among the hardest in the world at the time. In fact, according to the diaries of Marc Le Ministral and Fabrice Guillot, the first ascents of Rêve de Papillon at Bux and La Crepinette at Eau Claire were made on the exact same day possibly simultaneously. And Ed Langer added another that same week, also in Bukes. In no small part due to those forward-thinking tactics developed at Sassois, the French were killing everybody. And so it's no surprise that 21-year-old Gibe Trebou steeped not only in a massive volume of climbing, but also hard, complex movement and relentless rule-breaking tactics would be right there in the mix, doing not only the second ascent of the country's first 13A, Chimpanzadrome, but also his first 13B, Fritz the Cat, at the same time as the grade appeared in France, which put him right where he knew he belonged, among the best. Not to mention, among the most brash of a new age who was redefining the sport. They'd show up at whatever popular French crag, causing some sort of trouble with their loud boom boxes and loud lycra and loud shouts of allez, allez, and be, well, loud, literally and figuratively. Tensions between the old and the new had reached a deafening roar. Trebou and his contemporaries had scoffed at the old timers for their French free tactics, pulling on gear to get up long routes, and were preaching the superiority of their by any means necessary hard free climbing. Loudly. Everyone took notice. Not everyone liked it, but they noticed. And sponsors? Well, they did like it. The 1980s was a hotbed of cultural tension and expression with post-punk and new wave dominating the French pirate radio stations. Bold, over the top, colorful, brash, loud. That's what sold. So that loud crew of young standard pushers were getting better and better, climbing full-time, supported by sponsorships, and by the end of the 80s, making money from the burgeoning competition scene. And that money, the ability to make a living while focusing on climbing, for Jibé Trebou, meant one thing, that he could travel the world, repeating the hardest things from the best climbers everywhere. And while there... Why not just send their unfinished projects as well, whether they liked it or not? We'll be right back. There are a lot of training boards out there these days. Like, a lot. Some better than others. But the best of all, the one built with mastery in mind, the one designed with purpose at every level, with two different layouts for one hold set, one mirrored and one sprayed, a 50-50 mix of wood and plastic grips, and over 8,000 climbs in the database and growing, is the Tension Board 2. For me, it's not even a question. The TB2 is the one. The mix of wood and plastic allows for skin-friendly, tiny grips as well as bigger, slopier, open-handed compression climbing. 145 unique shapes, to be exact. And there are four different board sizes, from 10x8 to 12x12. So whether you run a gym, built yourself a training shed, or you're a cellar dweller like those strong Brits in the 1990s, they've got one for you. TensionClimbing.com. Mastery over success.
pressure to finish new routes pushes difficulty. The best way to prevent progress is keep a line to yourself for two or three years. Jibé Trabou was no stranger at Smith Rock. He'd been there in 1986, scooping the Americans by sending the first 14A in the U.S., the aptly named To Bolt or Not To Be. In fact, it should probably be called Bolted by Alan Watts or Not To Be, but that doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. And Trabou knew Watts had an eye for hard, high-quality lines, and so he kept a watchful eye trained on Watts. In 1991, he was in Smith again, this time on another Watts-bolted route. In this case, Watts asked him not to try it, as he'd spent over 40 hours just cleaning the route and was close to getting it done. But covertly, Trabou did the route anyway, and despite English not being his first language, gave it the most appropriate possible name, a double entendre whose meaning changes depending on how you're reading it. I am a bad man. I am a bad man. And it was around this time that Trabou really took notice of the line of bolts stretching 140 feet up the impressive monkey face pillar, the standout line on the standout formation. He knew that Watts, ahead of his time as usual, had bolted it back in 1989. He knew that a few strong climbers had tried it and deemed it too futuristic. And he decided right then and there that it was going to be too much for the American contingent, even for U.S. superstar Scott Franklin, who had spent some time on the route. In my opinion, if a route is idle, it's fair game for anyone. And so he did some cleaning, maybe a little aggressive cleaning here and there, moved a few bolts, and started trying the moves. And just as he suspected, it was going to be hard. One of the hardest. He had to have his name on it. After 15 days of effort, he was close, falling near the top. But weather and skin don't wait for anyone, no matter how loud you are about it. It got hot. He split his fingertips. He ran out of time. Trabou returned home to France, very disappointed. For the first time in his life, he wondered if he had reached his peak. For eight months, he couldn't find his trademark self-confidence. I believed I was a bad climber, he'd later say. Ironically, it was English climber Ben Moon swooping into France to claim two of the country's hardest unclimbed projects that spurred Trabou back into action. Moon had cleverly given the roots the names Agincourt and Maginot Line. Agincourt after a battle in which the English defeated the French, and Maginot Line after the expensive fortifications built by France in order to deter an attack by Germany. France got complacent, believing their defenses impenetrable, and Germany successfully invaded. The roots were the first two 14Bs in France. And while Trabou had to smile at the antagonistic nature of the names, he also took it personal. He had to respond. The first order of business was to repeat Maginot Line, which he did in short order. The second order of business, well, that was going to have to wait. As long as that face in Smith remained unclimbed, he was going to have self-doubts. And he'd need all of his confidence for this battle with Ben Moon. I have to go back and just do it, just, just he do kept it. telling just himself. Do it. Just, just do it. Just do it. To make matters worse, fellow countryman and one of the strongest French climbers, Didier Rabatou, had gone to Smith specifically for this unclimbed prize and was getting close to the sand. Jibé wasn't sure what was worse, not getting it done himself or another French climber doing it first. Trabou was competitive, sure, because he loved this intensely. Yes, he spent a lot of his time as a competition climber, but he viewed it as a nearly separate sport, or at best, 
training for the real thing. I will never give up hard routes for the sake of competition, he'd say. To me, climbing is above all else a lifestyle, regardless of whether you climb 514 or not. At any grade, the climbing experience is a passion. But don't get it twisted. That doesn't mean for a second that he was going to let Didier scoop him. No chance. So Jibé Tribu kicked into high gear. We'll be right back. What's up, everybody? I just wanted to drop in here to say thank you. Projects like this take way too many hours to make, and it just doesn't happen without your support. So whether it's training plans, courses, or products, it's your support of Power Company Climbing, as well as our sponsors here on this show, that has given me the time and motivation to conceptualize and create things like this podcast. So as a thank you, we're offering 20% off of almost everything on our site. Finger files, clippers, apparel, proven plans, ebooks, courses, and more. For details, go to powercompanyclimbing.com slash stone. And then use the code stone, that's S-T-O-N-E, at checkout. Powercompanyclimbing.com. Learn. Grow. Excel. Overhanging about 30 feet in its 140-foot length, the Smith Project would demand technical mastery. The first 80 feet, clocking in at 8A+, or 13C, is nearly dead vertical, with small holds and little opportunity to rest. In the top 60 feet, well, that's a different game. Punching its ticket at 14A, or 8B+, it's steep and strenuous, involving a series of tiny edges, two-finger pockets, and big run-out throws. Tribu knew the details, and so from January through March, his small basement Woody witnessed a man obsessed. I trained for power and endurance, so I would have a greater margin on the moves, he explained. But Jibé Tribu was no dummy. He knew the power was only part of the equation. Even though it requires top physical conditioning, the principal difficulty of the route is psychological. The climber must maintain an extremely high level of concentration with only a few shakeouts over 20 minutes of highly technical climbing. It's very difficult to stay focused and continue executing tough moves with precision for such a long time. I targeted my training to make me more comfortable on the second part so I would have a chance to link the entire route quickly. In early April 1992, the French superstar landed once again in the United States, determined to succeed in order to pull him the last bit out of his slump. He went straight to Smith Rock and dropped his pack beneath the imposing, exquisite East Face of Monkey Face. For nearly a week, he refamiliarized himself with the delicate moves and finicky body positions. He made big links into the upper root where the rock turns purple and the moves get harder and harder. Three times he fell on the first throw after the powerful two-finger crux. But he was learning and holding tight to hope. No, not hope. Certainty. Because he'd been here before. He knew how to work a project. He knew how to believe where others couldn't fathom a positive outcome. He loved challenging himself. And most of all, he loved climbing and everything it entailed. He was a lifer. Everyone who met him knew it. Maybe that's why he got away with snaking projects and ignoring local etiquette. Because despite how much trash he could talk, he always backed it up. And then he congratulated you on your send no matter the grade. Or he at least complimented you on how great the route he stole that you bolted was. Because even if he so badly wanted to be the first, if he got one-upped, he'd also be the first to point it out. And although he would throw darts at the outdated ethics of the Americans, prodding them to accept sport climbing, he still respected the stubbornness that got them there in the first place. 
and he genuinely loved the climbing and the people in the U.S. climbing community. Jibé Tribu was a climber's climber. And so 10 days after touching down in Oregon, Tribu again tied in beneath the route he would later name as a jab at the traditionalists, an urgent message to himself, and a paid homage to a respected, dominant athlete. He'd pull on his favorite Air Jordan tank top, paired with those leopard print Lycra shorts that it seemed he had an entire suitcase full of. All post-punk and new wave and overflowing confidence. He still had his haters. Anybody pushing boundaries does. But by this time, most of Smith Rock was pulling for him. They wanted him to send as badly as he wanted to just do it. He steps onto the wall and begins the relentlessly choreographed dance. The vertical nature of this first half could lull a climber into thinking it's going to be a delicate, ballet-like affair. But the volcanic rock here isn't about that. Appropriately called welded tough and formed from the spray of hot ash, the rock on this route is all sharp crimps and side pulls, just a little further apart than you want, making this a full body, powerful experience with lots of opportunities for mistakes. Tribu let his intense preparation and years of experience take over. He moves through the small error, staying focused on the next move, the next sharp edge, the next non-existent foothold. Soon, he's at the halfway rest stance. He takes stock of how he's feeling, fingers tired, but still with a lot left. Pumped, too pumped to continue straight away, but this hold is big and he can get some back. Of course, like much of Smith Rock, the options for feet here are barely better than miserable, so he has to be careful not to stay too long and end up with overly fatigued feet and calves. While there, he lets his mind wander to his conversations with his good friend Didier after he'd returned from trying the route. Collectively, they were sure it would be 14C the first in the country, one of the hardest in the world, on the same level as his now arch-rival Ben Moon's Hubble and Wolfgang Gulich's Action Direct, neither of which had been confirmed at their suggested grade. He knew there would be detractors, people who didn't feel he was that good. But he was, and he was positive this route would eventually prove it. Because those other routes? They were just short affairs of power, basically bouldering, and Tribu was sure that the future of sport climbing would be the longer, more technical, more psychologically challenging mega pitches, just like this one. He's there for around 10 minutes. He's not totally physically recovered. His fingers and forearms feel good, but his legs are now burning. Mentally though, he's ready having erased from his mind the earlier mistakes and any doubt that's crept in. His focus is at 100%, as if he's starting from the ground. He enters the purple rock, where the climb steepens and transforms into an entirely different beast. He knows this first boulder problem well, and he executes it perfectly, stopping briefly at a marginal rest where he catches his breath before launching into the crux. A series of big dynamic reaches on small edges leads to a devious sequence of two finger pockets and terrible cramps. He's pumped, but still moving, still executing, still latching the holds at the full extension of his reach. Facing the big throw where he's fallen three times, a flicker of doubt crosses his mind. But he pushes it out and goes, not hesitating long enough for the onlookers to notice. And he's caught it. This is his game. It's not over by a long shot, and the pressure is on. The holds get a little bigger, but so do the reaches, and he's racing the pump clock. And with no way to stop, he skips the next clip and sets up for the run out rightward throw to the jug. No doubt this time, just confidence. He catches it with authority. (sighs) Shake a little. Breathe. Collect yourself. One more thin move. Just do it.
Stone is produced by me, Chris Hampton, with help from Riley Rush and Emily Holland for Plug Tone Audio, a group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. At the link in your show notes, you'll find all the things you expect and probably some you don't. And look, this show is 100% rooted in the facts, but like Todd Skinner always said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. If you love what you're hearing, give us those five stars and a glowing review. And tell everyone you know at the crag, at the gym, follow the pod on your friends' phones and share it all over your social medias. And together, we can tell the stories of climbing's most important ascents one decade at a time. Donors, Happy New Year 2024, which is wild to me because uh, as I was making that video list the other day, I went ahead and started mid-80s, went to mid-2000s so that I'll have some of those ready for future seasons. And it occurred to me that 2005 was almost 20 years ago. Sorry if that just made you feel really old, but now you know how I feel. Jibé Tribu, man, I, at the beginning of this season, especially with the very first episode, the Lynn Hill episode, which was the very first I wrote and recorded sort of as a, a pilot for this whole thing. And at the time I was like, am I just going to make this guy a villain the whole time? And then he, he sort of antagonizing Ben Moon and it felt even more like a villain. So I'm glad to get to, um, get to make him a hero for a minute. And there is a conversation coming up next week, middle of next week, actually, um, that paints this in a really cool perspective that I didn't expect to happen. Um, it was kind of a last minute interview, but I'm really glad I did it because I think it's really special. And on Monday of next week, I'll just come out and say it. We're talking to Adam Andra about uh, Just Do It and the importance of history. And I don't think there's anyone better to talk to about that. He takes such care in um, making sure that the history of the roots that he's climbing shine through in the videos he makes and in the interviews he does. And it's so cool. So it's a really cool conversation coming next week. And then you get a bonus episode again, because I can't help myself. And our friend Tribu, as well as Ben Moon, are going to play key roles in this bonus episode that was really fun to make. But with, uh, with Jibe no longer being the villain, there's another one coming that I didn't expect. Uh, I, I didn't know this person was going to become a bit of a villain in the 90s. Um, it shocked me. It surprised me. But that's just the the history of it. Um, when we go back and we look, that's the way it turns out. That's all I'm going to say about that for now. Um, you'll hear more about that very, very soon. All right. If you have not yet, please go join the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Secret Stoners Club, all one word. It's free to join. Uh, I want your input and your feedback, and I want to have a conversation over there about what comes next and about what we've missed in the 90s that I can make bonus mini episodes uh, for all of you over there at the Patreon. So join over there, please. I'll see you next week. Bye.